Hello everybody, welcome back to the channel. Excuse the fan if you can hear it, it's really hot and muggy, even though it's raining out here in the UK and I do not do well with the heat, probably due to my age. I did that thing again. Do you remember? I bought a box of books for a small amount. I did it again. This box of books was even cheaper. So this is it here. <laughs> and there are 40 books in here and they cost me £12.74 and shipping was included in that so we're looking at less than £10 for 40 books so we've shipped it in banana boxes banana boxes are one of the best book, book types of thing to put books in for transport because they're really really sturdy as long as there's no nasty um, ooh, um, books in here, uh, books, like, nasty things like spiders. So I'm going to go through them, some of them I might have, and as I did before, if I've got, if I've got them, I'm going to put ones I have into a bag to go to charity or to a thing, and I can see one of the ones on the top I've got, and some I'm not sure of, so I'll have a pile of ones I haven't got, a pile of ones I have got, and a pile of ones I'm not sure of. So the first book is Hush Hush by Becca Fitzpatrick. Uh, falling for the Falling. Nora Grain, romance was never part of the plan. Not until Patch came along with his easy smile and eyes that seemed to see inside her, Nora is drawn to him against her better judgement. But after a series of terrifying encounters, Nora isn't sure if she can trust him. Patch seems to be everywhere she is and to know more about her than her close friends. And when she tries to see cancer, she discovers she's right in the middle of a centuries-old battle between the immortal and the fallen, and it's time to take sides. Okay, sounds interesting. This one is, oh, Wolf Hall by Hilary Mantle. Now, this I've heard of, I haven't read it. So I'm happy to have it. In Wolf Hall, one of our very best writers brings the opulent, brutal world of the Tudors to a bloody, glittering life. It's the backdrop of the rise and rise of Thomas Cromwell, low-born boy, charmer, bully, master of deadly intrigue, and finally, one of the most, most powerful of Henry VIII's courtiers. Hmm. Historical fiction? Haven't read that, haven't got that. The next one is The the Guts by Roddy Doyle, author of The Commitments. So let's have a look. The man who invented The Commitments back in the 80s is now 47 with a loving wife, four kids and bowel cancer. He isn't dying, he thinks, but he might be. He isn't dying, he thinks he might, he thinks, but he might be. Jimmy still loves his music and he still loves to hustle on his path through Dublin. He meets two of the commitments. Outspan, whose own illness is probably terminal, and Imelda Quirk, still as gorgeous as ever. Warm, funny novel about friendship and family, facing death and opting for life. Ah, so it's a sequel to, to the commitments. Very nice. Sorry, Dad. Then here we've got Melvin Bragg, The Soldier's Return. I definitely haven't read that. Uh, when Sam Richardson returns in 1946 from the Forgotten Wall in Burma to Wigton in Cumbria, he finds the town little changed, but the war has changed him, broadening his horizons as well as leaving him with traumatic memories. In addition, his six-year-old son now barely remembers him, and his wife has gained a sense of independence from her wartime jobs. As all three strive to adjust, the bonds of loyalty and love are stretched to breaking point in this taut, profoundly moving novel, which captures what millions experienced in the aftermath of the Second World War. That should be fascinating, actually. And we've got Penny Vincenze, Forbidden Places. I'm not sure if I've read or got this one because I have got some Penny Vincenze on my TBR. But this is about love and marriage, families and secrets, wartime and what it does to every accepted social value. It's a story of three women and one family. One is married and widowed within five years. She's free to start again, or is she? The second has a perfect husband she thinks she loves. He becomes a grotesque parody of what he once was. Is that love real? The third becomes trapped in a nightmare marriage. Can the war free her? I don't think I've read it, but I'm not sure if I've got it. So next is A Straight White Male by John Niven. Let's just have a quick sip of my lovely wine. Kennedy Marr, a novelist from the old school and borderline alcoholic, is writing film scripts in LA, insulting his way through Californian society and trying to screw every woman he meets. But he's also suffering from writer's block and unpaid taxes. 
Then a solution presents itself. Ma is to be the unlikely recipient of a prize for outstanding contribution to modern literature. An award worth half a million pounds. The catch he must spend a year teaching at an English university where his ex-wife and his estranged daughter now reside. As Kennedy acclimatises to the sleepy campus, he's forced to reconsider his precarious lifestyle. Incredible as it may seem, there might actually be a father and a teacher lurking inside this preening narcissistic preopic sociopath. Or is there? Ah, oh, sounds different. Why not? Definitely haven't read that one. The Refugee, My Journey to the Safe House for Battered Women, Jenny Smith. Oh gosh, that's going to be a hard read, I think. It's going to be like a memoir. Where is she? She is the devil and I've come to kill her. Lenny was out of control, a human wrecking ball, hell bent on hunting me down. I frantically scrambled upstairs to the attic, knowing that when he made it up here, I had to be prepared to fight to the death. Oh God. Until the 1970s, victims of domestic violence were expected to kiss and make up, hide their injuries and bear the shame that their partner's brutality was somehow their fault. Chiswick Women's Aid was Europe's first ever refuge for what were then called battered women, and Jenny Smith was one of the first people to make their way to this much needed sanctuary. In fear for her life and the welfare of her children, she'd fled her partner carrying only a few possessions. In the Chiswick shelter, Jenny found countless women in the same position, all with harrowing stories to tell. Amenities were basic, but the kindness of the community helped give Jenny a new lease of life. This powerful memoir chronicles a life that begins with a loving family in a Derbyshire mining village in the 50s that was torn apart by tragedy and follows Jenny's story through to the change in East End in the 60s to a place in the ref refuge and beyond. That sounds absolutely heartbreaking basis, like a real story, real memoir. Don't usually go for those, but I'm interested. One book I have got, so I'm not going to read the back because I will have read it before, is... Eleanor Oliphant is completely fine. So we'll put that to one side because we don't need that one. Let's see what else we've got. We've got The Meg. Now this one Steve Donahue raves about, I believe, by Steve Alton. Seven miles down on a top secret dive into the Pacific Steepest Trench, Commander Jonas Taylor came face to face with the largest and most ferocious predator ever to inhabit the planet. Carchiodon Megalodon, the 60 foot 70,000 pound prehistoric ancestor of the great white shark. Jonas escaped with his life, the dive's sole survivor, but his knavery career was over, his nightmare encounter written off as an hallucination. But Jonas knows what he saw was real. He's determined to prove that Megalodon still feeds in the ocean's unexplained depths. Unexplored depths, not unexplained depths. Now, after seven years of research and study, he finally has his chance to return to the abyss. Diving deeper than ever before, Jonas will fare to her out like he's never imagined. The Meg is about to surface, and when she does, nothing in no one is going to be, self, to be safe. Sounds good. Because I know there's been a few books about Megalodons and the Meg, and this is the, the main one, I think. I have no idea, but yeah, I'll look forward to that. I've read Jaws. I can manage that. So this is, I do love these mixed bag books because you just don't know what you're going to get. So far I've got one that I've got and none that I've read and I don't think I've got the Forbidden Places. I'm not sure. I will check that after on my Goodreads because all my TBR, all the books I've read are on there. If they're not on there, if I have read it, it's so long ago. I think I joined Goodreads in 2011. This, These Foolish Things by Deborah Mugach. Mugach? I don't know. Um, when Ravi Kapoor, an overworked London doctor, is driven beyond endurance by his obnoxious father-in-law, he asks his wife, can't we just send him away somewhere, somewhere far, far away? His prayer seems to have been answered when his entrepreneurial cousin, Sonny, sets up a retirement home, recreating a lost quarter of, quarter of, corner of England in a converted guesthouse in Bangalore. Travel and setup are expen inexpensive, staff willing and plentiful, and the British pensioners can enjoy the hot weather and take mango juice with their gin. Sounds interesting. I'll just take mango juice there, please. Now, this is an author I like, and I don't think I've read this one. Michael Conley, The Gods of Guilt. I'm pretty sure I haven't read this one. Definitely haven't read this one. Mickey Haller gets the text, Call Me ASAP 187, and the Californian penal code for murder immediately gets his attention. Suddenly, Mickey's not just trying to get his client off a murder charge, but there's a more personal connection. The victim was Gloria Dayton, his own former client, a prostitute he thought he'd rescued and put on the straight and narrow. Far from saving her, Haller may have been her downfall. Haunted by the ghosts of his own past and with his own guilt or redemption on the line, he desperately needs to find out who Gloria really was and who ultimately was responsible for her death. Ooh, 
Yeah, I haven't read that one. Oh, this is one I have, I have read and I have got. So that's fine. It's my week with Marilyn. I'm a Marilyn fan. You know I'm going to have this one. So this is the basically 1956 Fresh Mox with 23-year-old Colin Clark worked as a humble gopher on the set of The Prince and Showgirl. Film United Britain's leading actor Lawrence Livia with Hollywood's most glamorous sex symbol Marilyn Monroe and clashes between them entered film legend. One glorious week the world's biggest farm star sought comfort in the arms of the set's most junior employee. This is the frank, fresh and comic story of how Clark came to share Monroe's confidences and her bed. Except for he didn't, he made a lot of it up and we know this for a fact. <laughs> He's a bit of a fantasist. There's a picture of Michelle Williams on the cover though. Very nice. Have I got that edition? I'm not sure if I've got that edition though. If I have got that edition, I'll keep it. But if I haven't, it can go. If I have, it can go rather. Okay, how to train your... Oh, how to twist dragon's tail. By Hiccup Horrendous Haddock 3. Translated from the Old Norse by Chrissy de Cow Cowles. This is going to be like middle grade or something, I would say. Sounds good to me that I like these sorts of things. The Firestone has been stolen, the volcano is active, and the exterminator dragons have their claws out. Can Hiccup be the hero of the hour? Who knows, but I don't know. He probably will be. I like the sound of that. Sounds fun. Uh, I might have that one as well. I'm not sure. The one I'm referring to is Die Tryin by Lee Child. I do pick up Lee Child books when I can. Uh, from the charity shop so this is one I don't I'm not sure of I don't know that one that goes there that one I'm not sure of so um Jack Reacher alone strolling nowhere a Chicago street in bright sunshine a young woman struggling on crutches he offers her a steady arm and turns to see a handgun aimed at his stomach chained in a dark van racing across America Reacher doesn't know why they've been kidnapped the woman claims to be FBI she's certainly tough enough but at that remote destination, will raw courage be enough to overcome the hopeless odds? So I need to check that. I might have that one over there already in my box of to be reds. So I'll pop that in the... I don't really know. I love this. There's so many books. Um, Tori Hayden, Overheard in a Dream. Best-selling author Tori Hayden's first novel is a fascinating study of a fractured family, a troubled child and a psychiatrist's effort to rescue them. Nine-year-old Connor, haunted by the ghost man, is labelled autistic. His mother, Laura, an aloof, enigmatic novelist, can't handle him. His rancher father, Alan, is fighting desperately to keep him from institutionalisation. As psychiatrist James is pulled more and more deeply into the mysterious workings of this family, he discovers a world where what is imagined might seem as real as what is true. A world that hides a terrible secret. Well, that sounds all right, doesn't it? James Patterson, Jack and Jill. I don't know if I've read this one. I might have, but if it is, it's such a long time ago, but it will go in my, I'm not sure, pile. Ooh, I haven't read that one. Um, but I don't think I have. A pair of ice cold killers have been picking off Washington's rich and famous with chilling professional efficiency. As the nation awaits the identity of the next celebrity victim, 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 Alex Cross, I love Alex Cross books, takes over the high profile investigation. With his proven ability to get inside the minds of the most deranged killers, he has the skills and the courage to crack the case. But will he discover the truth before Jack and Jill set their sights on Washington's ultimate celebrity target? Mm. Don't think so. Ooh, what's this one? Uh, Murder on Lusitania by Edward Marston. I like the sound of this one. September 1907 and George Dillman set sail from Liverpool to New York on the Lusitania's maiden voyage. Posing as a passenger, Dillman is in fact an undercover detective hired by the Cunard Line to keep an eye out for petty crimes. But after some eventful days aboard, the ship's blueprints are stolen and then a body is found. As Dillman works to get to the bottom of the crimes, he makes an unusual friend, first class passenger Genevieve Maysfield, and the two uncover secrets aboard the ship that prove explosive. It was previously published under the name of Conrad Allen. Ah, right, okay. That sounds good. John Grisham. The Abduction. I haven't got this one. Theodore Boone is back in a new adventure and the stakes are higher than ever. When his best friend April disappears from her bedroom in the middle of the night, no one, not even Theo Boone, has the answers. As fears ripple through his small hometown and the police hit dead ends, it's up to Theo to use his legal knowledge and investigative skills to chase down the truth and save April. Filled with a page turning suspense that makes John Grisham the undisputed master of the legal thriller, Theodore Boone's trials and triumphs will keep readers guessing until the very end. Ah. 
the Anne Moretti Nine Perfect Strangers. Have I got this? The cover looks familiar, but then they tend to go through fads of the covers being almost identical. So this will go into the ones I'm not sure. I know I have read Leanne Moriarty before, uh, but let's have a look. One luxury retreat in the middle of nowhere, 10 days which no one can leave, nine strangers seeking perfection and each discovering the perfect lie. Hmm. Not sure, so we're going to put that in the I'm not sure pile. Next one I definitely haven't got. This is Murder in an Irish Churchyard by Carleen O'Connor. I like the cover. Her first official case is a grave matter. After solving two murders in the County Cork village of Kilbane, Siobhan O'Sullivan has accepted a calling and decided to join the Garda Siochana. I can't pronounce that. I do apologise to anyone Irish. If you let me know how to pronounce that, I would love, love you forever. The O'Sullivan clan couldn't be prouder, but there's no time to celebrate as she's already on another case, summoned by the local priest who just found a dead man in the St Mary's graveyard. Above ground. He's a stranger, but the priest has heard talk of an American tourism town, town, town searching for his Irish ancestor. As Siobhan begins to dig for a motive among the gnarled roots of the victim's family tree, she'll need to stay two steps ahead of the killer or end up with more than one foot in the grave. See, this sounds really good. It's listed on the back as a gripping, cosy mystery. An Irish one, obviously. I love the idea of this. You've got, you've got your murder mystery. You've got genealogy. It's, oh, it sounds really good. Oh, Bill Bryson. Life and Times of the Thunderbolt Kid Travels Through My Childhood. Paul might like this one. He likes this sort of book. Bill Bryson's first travel book opened with the immortal line, I come from Des Moines. Somebody had to. In this deeply funny new book, he travels back in time to explore the ordinary kid he once was in the curious world of 1950s America. That would be quite interesting. It was a happy time when almost everything was good for you, including DDT, cigarettes and nuclear fallout. This is a book about one boy's growing up, but in Bryson's hand it becomes everyone's story. One that will speak volumes, especially to anyone who has ever been young. Now that does sound quite like a good book. Let me have a little drink because I'm thirsty. I love getting these books. Don't you love these videos? This is episode two. It might be a series, you never know. Oh, now I have read this, but I haven't read it for a long time. I've been thinking about getting a copy of this to reread. So this will be staying To Kill a Mockingbird by Harper Lee. So yes, I have read this before, years ago when I was in school. So I will be definitely in really good condition. So it'll probably stay in the permanent collection. So Atticus Finch gives this advice to his children as he defends a real mockingbird of this classy novel, a black man charged with attacking a white girl. Through the eyes of Scout and Jem Finch, Lee explores the issues of race and class in the deep south of the 30s with compassion and humour. She also creates one of the great heroes of literature in their father, whose lone struggle for justice pricks the conscience of a town steeped in prejudice and hypocrisy. So yeah, I mean, it's been a long time since I've read it, so I'll be really looking forward to reading this one again. Um, I haven't read the sequel, but once I've read this one, I will probably go out and buy the sequel uh, to Set a Watchman, just so I can see what happens next. So I'm really excited that that one's in there. I'm really pleased. Oh, this one's got a folded cover, but that doesn't matter. Ooh, there's a piece of paper in here as well. What's this say? Aero. I think somebody marked it with a post-it note, um, but they didn't get very well. Uh, Oliver James Affluenza. I have no idea. An epidemic of affluenza is sweeping through the English speaking world. An obsessive, obsessive envy is keeping up with the Joneses that makes us twice as prone to depression, anxiety, and addictions than people in other developed nations. And now we're infecting the rest of the world with this virulent virus. In this eloquent account, James reveals how issues like consumerism, property fever, and the battle of the sexes vary across societies with different values, beliefs, and traditions, and leads us to an unavoidable and potentially life-changing conclusion that to ensure our mental health, we can and must pursue our needs rather than our wants. That's more of a pull book, but yeah, okay. Right, we have now got Susan Lewis taking chances. So one of these tiny paperbacks. When Gina is Rachel Comedy is kidnapped and murdered by a Colombian drug cartel, her lover and partner Tom Chambers, racked with guilt, vows to avenge her death. Ellen Shelby and Michael McCann want to turn Rachel's story into their first Hollywood movie, whilst Chambers agrees to track down the killers, but his need for vengeance soon overrides their desires. In London, high flyer Sandy Paul, helping to raise finance for the film, still harbours a fierce passion for Michael and aims to remove Ellen from his life. 
love, lust, jealousy, ambition, take the stage with high finance, power, mortal danger, torn loyalties, male pride and female desires, turn the movie into a terrifying trap of death, threats and destruction. Now the first half of that sounded very familiar, so I'm going to put it in my I'm not sure pile. Another Melvin Bragg one here called Remember Me. It was not love at first sight. It proved to be not much of a conversation. Nothing should have come of it. A passionate but ultimately tragic love affair starts when two students, one French and one English, meet at university in the beginning of the 60s. From its tentative early stages, the relationship develops into a life-changing one whose profound impact continues to reverberate 40 years on. Hmm. That sounds interesting. Mm -hmm. This is, oh, this is a big paperback book. Oh, we've got some vintage, oh, now I have read that one and I've got a copy of it, but that's a better copy, so I'm going to keep that one probably. Stephen Pressfield, Last of the Amazons. Nice cover. Good condition. No breakage to the spine there. I too was numbered among them on the day when the Amazons came, women the equal of men. In or around 1250 BC, so Plutarch tells us, Thesis, Theseus, king of Athens and slayer of the Minotaur, set sail on a journey that brought him to the land of Talkirt, the free people, a nation of fiercely proud and passionate warrior women whom the Greeks called Amazons. Bound to each other as lovers as well as fighters and owing allegiance to no man, the Amazons distrusted, trusted the Greeks with their boastful talk of cities and civilization. and when their illustrious war queen Antiope, 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 Antiope I don't know, fell in love with Theseus and fled to Athens with him, they were outraged. Raising a vast army, the Amazons marched on Athens. History tells us they could not win, but for a brief and glorious moment, the Amazons held the Attic world in thrall before vanishing into the immortal realms of myth and legend. Ooh. Echoing to the sound of brutal battles fought hand to hand and peopled with wonderfully realised flesh and blood characters, here is Stephen Pressfield's most thrillingly imagined novel yet. In this moving tale of love and war, honour and revenge, he brings the ancient world to brilliant life to recount the extraordinary near forgotten story of the last of the Amazons. Right. So yes, um, I do have this book test the reveals. This is a nice copy though. Thomas Hardy. I love Thomas Hardy, one of my favourite authors. <clears throat> Tess is an innocent young girl until the day she goes to visit her rich relatives, the D'Urbervilles, in the hope that they might help alleviate her family's poverty. Their encounter with her manipulative cousin Alec leads her onto a path that is beset with suffering and betrayal. When she falls in love with another man, Angel Claire, Tess sees a potential escape from her past, but only if she can tell him her shameful secret. Aww. I like the cover. So we'll pop that one in the, in the keep pile. Um, we're near the end now. Uh, let's have a look at this one. Ooh, got that one as well. I'm actually reading that one at the moment. So there we go. Uh, Rachel Hall, The Hidden Years. A Cornish Summer, A Chance of oh, Cornwall. Set in Cornwall is going to be good. What's this? Is this just... Oh, it's just where the pages were folded at back. Two women's stories collide in a tale of secrets, loss and betrayal. It's 1966 and Belle Johnson abandons her studies to follow her new boyfriend, Grey, to Silverwood home to artistic community on the Cornish coast. Why does the name Silverwood sound so familiar? And who is Imogen Lockhart, the young nurse who arrived at that very house in 1939 at the outbreak of war, whose story Belle will uncover all these years later? As the summer months unfold, Belle begins to learn the truth about hidden secrets from the past and about the person that she wants to be. Oh, I don't like it. And there's it. My cat's down here. So yes, the other one I've got is The Other Berlin Girl by Philip Gregory. Do you know what? I was really hoping, it's actually a better condition one than what I've got, that it would be a different uh, Philip Gregory one. But what I might do is that's better condition than the one I'm reading is I might read that one and if I want to keep it, I'll keep it this one. Sarah Vaughan, An Anatomy of a Scandal. A high profile marriage thrust into the spotlight, a prosecutor who believes justice has been a long time coming, a scandal that will rock Westminster and the women caught at the heart of it. I'm not sure about that one. But I'll be, I'll be checking them all anyway when I start listening to my good reads. Uh, Susan Lewis, who's lying now. I'm, I'm sure I've read a Susan Lewis. We had another one, didn't we? This one's a really wrecked, but I'm only going to read it. Who's lying now? 
You think you know your neighbours? When Jeannie Simmons vanishes without a trace, her small town is thrown into disarray. You think you know, you know who to trust? Cara Jakes, a trainee investigator, begins to interview Jeannie's friends and neighbours, sure that someone has something to hide. Behind every door is a different story, but how can you separate truth from the lies? Bye, Sid. The cat's just left the room. Oh. One last secret by Adele Parks. I don't know if I've got this one. I know I've got another Adele Parks on my shelf. I read one last month. Or the month before. I've read one this year anyway. Uh, a week at a beautiful French chateau should be an easy final job for Dora. She's smart, stunning and discreet. She only needs to convince the other guests that she's Daniel's girlfriend. One final luxurious week and she can leave the dangerous, difficult escort world because Dora has fallen in love and is ready to embrace a better future. But as the guests assemble, it becomes terrifyingly apparent that putting her past behind her is impossible and one last secret could cost Dora everything, including her life. Ooh. I will check that one. I'm not sure whether I've got that one. Uh, Dan Brown Origin. I think I've got this on audiobook, but I, have, I certainly haven't got a paper copy. I think I've got Inferno over there somewhere but I'm sure I'm sure it's over there and I'm sure it's Inferno Harvard Professor Robert Langdon again arrives at the Guggenheim Museum Bilbao to attend the unveiling of an astonishing scientific breakthrough the evening's host is billionaire Ed Edmund Kirsch a futurist whose dazzling high-tech inventions and audacious predictions have made him a controversial global figure but before his secret can be revealed, the meticulously orchestrated evening is blown apart. With his life under threat, Langdon is formed, forced to flee, aided by the museum's director, Ambra Vidal. If they are to beat a devious enemy to Kirsch's discovery, Langdon and Vidal must follow a perilous trail signposted only by enigmatic symbols, hidden history and elusive modern art. At its end, they will come face to face with a breathtaking truth that has remained buried until now. Ooh. Be a second. Phew, it's so warm and really hot. The shower I'm gonna get over in the morning. Next, we've got Joby, Jody Pico, Small Great Things. Now, I've got quite a few Jody Pico to read. I don't know if I've got this one. It's not in brilliant condition, but I don't think I've got this one. When a newborn baby dies after a routine hospital procedure, there's no doubt about who will be held responsible. The nurse who had been banned from looking after him after, by his father. What the nurse, the lawyer, and the father of the child cannot know is how this death will irrevocably change all of their lives in ways both expected and not. Small Great Things is about prejudice and power, it's about that which decides and unites us. It's about opening your eyes. So I'm not sure about that one, because I know I've got a, about three or four Jody Picos, because I'm picking them up as and when I find them. Then we have got Year of Wonders, or oh, the Novel of the Plague, that sounds uh, <clears throat> charming, Geraldine Brooks. It's spring 1666 when the Great Plague reaches the quiet Derbyshire village of Iam. The villagers make an extraordinary decision. They elect to isolate themselves in a fateful quarantine. So begins the Year of Wonders, seen through 18-year-old Anna Frith's eyes as she confronts the loss of her family, the dis disintegration of her community and the lure of a dangerous and illicit love. Based on a true story, this novel explores love and learning, fear and fanaticism and the struggles of 17th century science and religion to interpret the world at the cusp of the modern era. Wow, that actually does sound really good. I am really pleased with these books. I've read so many books throughout my life that there comes time when I'm going to get doubles. So the fact I've got a few doubles in here and a few I'm not sure of, two definite doubles anyway, two out of 40 is not bad because I know I haven't got the rest because I can see them all here. Next is Fault Lines by Nancy Houston. This is another one of those big floppy paperbacks that we all love. Yeah. Sol is a highly gifted but also scarily unchildlike six-year-old whose adoring mother believes he is destined for greatness. He bears the same birthmark as his father, grandmother and great-grandmother before him. When Sol and his family make an unexpected trip to Germany, terrible secrets start to emerge. Narrated by children in four different generations of the same family, Fort Lines traces their history back through the years, from California to New York, from Haifa to Toronto and Munich. As dormant family secrets are awakened, shockwaves reverberate from a hidden past into a fragile present. Mmm! Sounds interesting. I've got a huge pile of books on my bed again. There's nothing new there then. Obviously I'm not going to put them back in this box. It's the wrong size for my corner. I have got some boxes on the top. I will get one down and put them in there. 
Freya North pillow talk. I like Freya North. I've read a few, but I don't think I've read this one. In fact, I'm pretty sure I haven't. So by day, Petra Flint is a talented jeweller working in a lively London studio. By night, she sleepwalks. She has 40 carats of the woods, rarest gemstone under a mattress, but there's skeletons in her closet that make it difficult for her to rest. Forsaking a rock and roll lifestyle for the moors of North Yorkshire, Arlo Savage teaches music as a remote boarding school, but like Petra, goes from the past to disturb his sleep. Petra and Arlo were teenage sweethearts. Now years later, in a tiny sweet shop, they stand before each other once more. Could this be their second chance? Oh, sounds nice. I like those. Uh, Anne Cleves, The Raging Storm. I've either got or read Anne Cleves in the past, but I haven't read this one, I'm pretty sure. So, Detective Matthew Venn returns in the next captivating novel by Anne Cleves, the number one best-selling author and creator of Vera and Shetland. When local legend and sailor Jem Roscoe blows into town in the middle of an autumn gale, the residents of Greystone Devon think nothing of it when he soon disappears again. That's the sort of man he is. Until the lifeboat boat is launched during a raging storm and his body is found in a dinghy anchored off the Scully Cove, a place with legends of its own. This is an unfortunate, uncomfortable case for Venn. He came to Greystone as a child, is community populated by the Barham Brethren, and when another body is found in the cove, Matthew soon finds his judgment clouded. As the stormy winds howl and the village is cut off, then and his team start their investigation, little realising their own lives might be in danger. Ooh. Jen just came in and then went out again. That's why I went like that, because I don't know what she was going to say, but she's gone back downstairs. Last book is Celia Imry, A Nice Cup of Tea. Now I did read nice work if you can get it and I really enjoyed that one so I'm looking forward to this <sighs> excellent this is a sequel for the from nice uh, work if you can get it so that should be good and the gorgeous restaurant La Mazique in the beautiful town of Bellevue sur Mer there's trouble in paradise retired expats Teresa Carol William Benjamin and Sally are desperately struggling to keep their business afloat when the much hopeful sale of their Picasso mosaic falls through, they realise it will take every bit of their talent and gumption to save La Mosique. But with fussy customers, obnoxious, obnoxious cruise parties and a failing delivery van, it's certainly not going to be easy. So yes, I did like the, the one I read, which was um, nice work if you can get it. So uh, this is a follow on from that. So yay, looking forward to that. I'm going to see if any of those ones I wasn't sure about I've got or not and then I'll be back to let you know how many of them were actually duplicates okay so I have literally just checked the books I put to one side and the only one I've actually read out of all of them is the Jack Reacher book but I didn't I read it so long ago it was like 2011 it's got on there um so I'm actually gonna re-add it to TBR and read it again because I like Lee Child so I'm gonna keep that one so the only two that I've definitely got was the Eleanor Oliphant is completely fine and the My Week with Marilyn. So that's pretty cool. And uh, like I said, I'll check to see if I've got that edition in my collection of Marilyn books. And if I haven't, I will will add it. But I'm not worried about that one. I am now going to add all of these to my TBR on Goodreads and my list challenges because I don't know how many of you do list challenges. Um, if you want to list challenges, you, you can challenge yourself to... Um, how many what books have you read on the list what movies have you seen what foods have you eaten what places have you been and there's lots of different lists and I, I like to do that and I create some lists every now and again one of the lists I'm doing is all the books I got in 2024 which is all over well it's 197 at the moment so it'll be over 200 when I put all these on I'm also doing a list of all the books I've read this year which is now at 99 only 76 to go to beat my Goodreads challenge do you know what I can do that quite easily so, and some of these books aren't that, that big but like I said those old books oh and the other Berlingo obviously but I said I'm going to keep that one and then if I like the book I haven't read much of it yet which I am enjoying it at the moment if I decide I want to keep it I will keep the other version uh, because that one's a bit more the one I'm reading is a bit more battered so I hope you've enjoyed episode 2 of A Mystery Box of Books from eBay there may be another one but if there is it probably won't be for a few months because uh, Paul will go absolutely off his head. I've got to get rid of some of the books that I've actually got here. Um, she's over 500 now on my a physical TBR. I should not be allowed on eBay 
I should not be allowed in bookshops so I bought one today in the bookshop which you'll see at the end of the month in the hall you won't see these in the hall because we've hauled them but you will see it in the the prop the, you see the other ones that I've got which isn't a huge amount I'm trying to stay away from bookshops and charity shops though you know I probably won't the good thing is Jennifer's out of school so I'm not going to go into the charity shop I normally go to because I don't need to go there near it I don't need to go near there when she's in school I mean, like I said, I hope you've enjoyed this video. At some point, I will read these books and you will see them again on the channel. That's it from me. Um, I hope you've enjoyed this extremely long video and I will see you again very, very soon. Bye, everybody.